Hi there, I'm Singai Shu at the Numeg Studio in New York City. This is my Pathways Forward series about reimagining the world of music in a post-pandemic world. There's nothing like the whole world falling apart to make us truly appreciate the moment. Um, I want to seize the day and really reflect on and synthesize my ideas and experiences around music education so that I can take the next step forward. Renee Brown has this amazing quote. She says, we are divine beings and we are creative by nature. So much so that unused creativity isn't benign. It creates all kinds of havoc like grief and rage and judgment. And I think that when I see someone recognize their inner creativity, I love being the person to help them answer that call by providing resources in the right environment, the right tools. Um, the mission of my Numex Studio is that I want to empower lifelong learners and music teachers with a vision for a dynamic music education. And this covers five themes. There is a transformation driven technical process, the adaptable framework, multiplying motivation, compassionate mentorship, and lastly, creativity as an ultimate measurement of success. So my perspective is coming from four things in my life. One is as a performer, I've been performing since I was four years old and there's things that work and things that are not so practical. Then there is um, my experience as a verbal communicator, as a music educator and public speaker for the past um, 13 years as a university faculty member for the past 14 years and as a piano teacher for about 30 years now. I started when I was very young, just as my daughter is doing now in her youth. It's a great way to synthesize material to teach others. And then I'm speaking as a parent who is constantly concerned about my daughter being swept away in this tide of endless amounts of homework in high school and deadlines and testing. The other day she was having a particularly hard time with just how many, I don't know, 12 different projects being due all on the same day. And what I could offer was to listen to her tell me about how difficult it was and to validate that her feeling of the value of creativity in her life is absolutely real and I agree with it 100%. And I think just hearing me say that helped her, empowered her to see this problem of time management as an opportunity for creativity in itself. How do you create little pockets of time in the midst of craziness in the midst of so much life pressure. And by reframing it as creative problem solving, we were able to just take baby steps away from the feeling of oppression. Lastly, my perspectives come from my taking dance class. Some of you may know that I am a huge dance fan. I watch it anytime I can get. And I have had the pleasure of making myself take um, classes as an adult. The golden nugget of each class is the moment when the dance teacher has done, you know, like 30 crazy steps in a row in her choreography. And then she's like, okay, give it a try, you guys. And uh, I have this moment of paralysis where I'm like, and then I know, I know that if I just wait for the next moment to come, my mind will start to chunk 
the choreography into sections that I will just take one step at a time and after doing it 10 times maybe I will get two chunks in a row and I start to find the order in the chaos and that is that is such a thrill that is my sense of adventure in life and that is the moment when I also feel like I have earned the right to teach because we teach best when we know exactly how it feels on the other side to be awkward about trying something new to feel that we can completely envision what we want to be doing but we can't physically do it yet and um i, I think that it keeps me humble when i am studying things that i am not good at and i hope that everyone can have that um have that thrill of adventure and do something they're not good at now in transformation driven um teaching i focus on what does the student need to have the best transformation in the best possible way there's different ways that i teach there's uh, consultations which is right before a competition or an audition and we just focus on what is possible in the last couple days of time that we have then there is pa lesson packages which is more um we decide ahead of time what the goal is something very specific as a sight reading how to sight read or something project driven like a recital program or a recording um, for my monthly cafes the transformation is to be able to slow down our listening so that we can really dive deep and hear the multiple layers and for intensives which are short classes with big results um, I decide what is the most urgent or the most relevant problem that my students are facing and how can I help them feel most confident about it to achieve mastery over this subject matter. And um, to demonstrate that, I'm going to talk to you about what I am in the middle of planning right now. It's my Hear That Harmonic Analysis Intensive starting March 17th. And what's exciting about this um, format is that really everything, when, when I start asking about what is going to make the most impact on my students, the, the answers come and the format comes. And so some of the questions that I'm asking myself, you know, um, what is going to help my students play the most expressively? The root of that issue is really about understanding the harmonic language and how the music was put together, where the tensions and releases are, what the intended emotions are from the composer. There's a language there to be learned and um, the chords that they choose have meaning in how they interact with each other. I'll share a little bit about how all this um, happened to me in, in my own career. I started learning music theory and oral skills when I was um, age six, before I even started public school. I was in Beijing and there was this great progressive music theory teacher, um, Xu Jingxing, who taught at the college level, but also had an interest in the potential of little kids. And I loved the respect that he gave me as a little, tiny little girl. Um, I love that he expected I could do difficult things if he just gave me a couple more tries. And the skills that I learned followed me all my life. Um, it allowed me to learn faster because I could understand what was on the page quicker. It allowed me to have the time then to be more exposed to more composers, more styles, and allowed me to test out of classes at Juilliard so then I can take the really exciting electives that I wouldn't have had time for otherwise. And so um, just to clarify, just identifying chords alone doesn't do anything for your expressive playing. But when we are able to be aware of what's going on in the harmonic language fast enough, then we start making more connections about um, what the bigger picture of harmonic progression is doing. And then we start to connect harmonic colors to emotions 
And then the more aware we are of our own emotions, the more we can imagine the um, composers who wrote these pieces when they were choosing these chords, what were they trying to emote? What were they trying to write into the music? And so anyway, it's a snowball effect. And it all starts with knowing the skills that you need and then knowing what direction to go with it. I remember a few years ago, um, I was invited to speak at the Music Teachers National Convention, and it was my first time. It was about pedagogy. Uh, no one expected that I would have an audience because it was, it was my first time and I didn't know anyone and no one knew me. But I chose the topic that I think was more, most urgent, which was harmonic analysis for how, you know, how to teach it and how to um, find the relevance, how to recognize the importance of it. And um, imagine my surprise when the entire hotel um, convention room was packed, was packed with people who wanted to understand how to teach this really elusive topic. Um, it is oftentimes seen as boring, you know, music theory book stuff that you do to pass the class. Um, it is rarely given the excitement and thrill it deserves for us to be artistic with our interpretations. Okay, let's go on to part two. Part two is an adaptable framework. So um, at the age of seven in China, that's when you start first grade, I went into first grade and I discovered the absolute power of the Chinese classroom teacher. It was a power to do something wonderful with the human potential, but it is often corrupted and diluted. And uh, somehow along the way, you know, you have these, I remember these poor, sweet kids uh, being made to stand in the corner because they weren't able to focus on, you know, math and writing at the age of seven, they had their own pace and they couldn't keep up and they were being punished for it. And that moment is still in my head. It's like a core memory. And I made unconsciously many lists of what I can do better when I became a grown up to teach people <laughs> before I even knew I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, and anyway, the point is that every person has this ideal learning pace for absorbing new information. It can't be too slow because I would be boring, but it can't be too fast because I would be frustrating. And the public classroom is too often one size fits all, and it doesn't have to be. Because if you look at homeschool programs, if you look at um, places, rural places where they had to put everybody of different ages and levels in the same class room. Um, there's oftentimes, you'll find that people are creatively find ways to give some autonomy to each group and then they compare answers and then the kids themselves will help teach each other. The um, older kids will know exactly what the younger kids need to absorb the information because they just went through it themselves. So anyway, I really believe in an adaptable framework to give students oversight and autonomy. It's a, it's a balance of the two, depending on what each student needs. Now, let's go back to, um, I mentioned peer-to-peer -peer learning. When I went to Nice, France, the summer of my freshman year, I discovered that European teachers taught master classes and um, you sat in on each other's lesson times and we learned so much from each other's time. Also the proximity of a student um, to you know the classmates in terms of the learning experience is important too. And we were hearing about how someone else was talking to the teacher with challenges that, that, that we were having ourselves. So it's a, it's a really great way, I think, this whole masterclass idea of absorbing a lot of information and seeing how everyone else is dealing with it. Now, um, when I was in college, I was dating this 
exciting, optimistic young composer, Daniel Kellogg, who is now my husband. And I remember we, um, our dates were walks in Central Park. And so often we would talk about the whole education system and how when we graduate, what could we do to make it more interesting, more fun, more practical. Uh, and now, here we are in New York, Dan is the um, president at Young Concert Artists trying to help some of the most talented artists in the world find their footing in entrepreneurship skills and establishing careers and in developing friendships with each other. And um, we used to have, when we were teaching at the University of Colorado, we used to have these um, end of the semester cookout parties and the whole department would come over and there would be spontaneous music jams, um, chess playing, uh, but it was a time for people to be reminded that they have each other, that they can ask each other questions. Well, how are you dealing with this? Um, the social times, the downtimes, there is a lot of um, learning going on in the unofficial times of education. The peer-to-peer -peer learning is so important. Um, when I am giving, uh, when, when I am doing online cafes, listening cafes, at the end I get out of the room, the virtual room, and I let them ask each other questions. And sometimes when they hear a peer explain something, it's in a safer mode than if I was the one talking about it. Um, and so yeah, we've always really valued creating opportunities for peer-to-peer um, -peer learning to happen. So uh, let's see, let's go on to online teaching format. Uh, Dan was one of the earliest teachers at the University of Colorado to offer online teaching. And he was really excited about how you can give students information ahead of class. Uh, they can absorb it at their own pace. And then the discussion happens. And uh, the discussion is really about the interaction and the absorption of the material and not just doling out facts. And so I also saw this on my own online teaching experience in this past year. And so, uh, the master classes that is part of my Hear That Intensive is, is exactly that. It is about digesting. It is about doing group, group drills and having um, friendships develop, peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, social motivation, and all of that. Uh, the other thing about the Hear That Intensive is that I saw um, Nathan Cole, who's a fabulous violinist turned online teaching guru, had done an event where his participants uploaded videos of themselves playing as part of the event. And it resonated with me. I, in fact, because my, one of my students really wanted to put her learning process online, but it's a really intimidating thing to do and to share publicly. However, by sharing it in a small group, just within the class, within the intensive, what I find to be valuable is this idea that if everyone did it together, then it is less intimidating. And it's holding yourself accountable because when you have to give an account of your learning process that week, then um, you're going to learn it really well. Then we have these weekly modules where you get all the information you need at the beginning of the week. And then in the middle of that week on Saturdays, we come together for master class learning and then you have a few more days to absorb and then even to redo the video if you like. Um, because I always believe in second chances and all that for creativity's sake. Now, um, part three is multiplying motivation. So we can multiply our motivation by sharing our experiences, our struggles with each other, sharing and learning and this positive comparison helps us to build multiple perspectives that enrich our understanding of the material. Now I remember um, years ago when I got a free ticket to a ballet competition at Lincoln Center 
and uh, everyone was doing the same compulsory dance. It was tutors, the leaves are fading, a pas de deux. And by the end of the competition, not only did I know the choreography really well, but I was really appreciating how each couple did some part of it in a very special way. And so for my intensive, part of the fun is that after everyone's taken a shot doing it on their own, we get to compare everyone's work to each other and we will find those special moments as a group. Um, I also believe very much in building positive emotions as we were, are doing group work, uh, like curiosity, having fun. It's important for our learning experience. So let's say you had a great teacher who introduced you to analysis as something exciting and fun. And every time you go back to that skill, your brain is going to say exciting and fun, wonderful. Now, what if you had a teacher who was authoritarian and was looking for mistakes every time you analyzed? Your brain is going to label analysis as something to be avoided. So in my intensive, I add a layer of motivation by having a contest with educational prizes. Winning is based on earning points by uploading videos of yourself doing the work and sharing online. And in the last round, everyone will also be invited to vote for one other person. Not the highest level of playing, but the most transformative work. That is the goal. Part four is compassionate mentorship. I want to get raw about emotions. The world of classical music is very competitive, starting at a very early age. And if you stay in it long enough, sooner or later, we all have someone very important tell us that we are not um, fast enough, we're not pretty enough, we're not smart enough. And it's just, it's part of the game. It's nothing personal, but it's hard to process that. So even if this happened a long time ago, it can still be traumatic now. And I want to encourage you that, you know, we can all deal with how to respond to past situations now, right now. We can decide whether to take that feedback or not. In my own growing up, I certainly had cried at my piano lessons and I felt bad for my teachers. There was an awkwardness in the room. They didn't quite know what to do with me. For me, uh, I don't mind when somebody gets upset at the piano lesson. I don't mind at all being with them through hard times, through the tough moments. And I think it, I'm really happy about my superpower to, to be present with them because I think it's really important to have a teacher who really believes that it's okay to fail. It's okay to fail and I want to remind them of that when they're going through their moment. I want to offer them emotional safety because I know that it means a lot when you are there in the pits. We don't have to figure things out on our own. We can get help, we can ask for help. Sometimes we just need the reminder that we're allowed. You know, especially after we've achieved um, certain great things in life, like having a successful career, or winning some big competition, or getting into a brand name conservatory, and suddenly we feel like we are supposed to be responsible and independent about all our artistic choices. Well, no, actually, um, you know, all the big name famous people are where they are because they had a lot of help. And I hear plenty of stories about high profile musicians who still secretly play for people. They have someone that they can, can play for to make sure that they are on track. And we all need that. I think we, we, all, we all need to continue to seek artistic excellence with um, 
with other people's fresh eyes, someone whose feedback we can trust. So uh, lastly, let me end with creativity as the ultimate measurement of success. I believe that creativity is the most undervalued skill in our education system. We hear this need to make success measurable. And I would counter that, you know, to be creative means to be able to think fast on your feet, to be free of the shoulds and what ifs, and to dare to experiment, to be able to grasp the big picture and switch quickly into the minute details at the same time on multiple layers of thinking, to be agile in how we engage with the information, with the people, with the circumstances. And creativity is a skill that we have to practice all the time to be good at is not some magic talent in a privileged few. The application of creativity as a skill is enormous. Imagine a world, a society where people create not one, but multiple solutions, where teachers and students can work together to make education fun and effective where students and kids can have the skills to create meaningful connections in their hearts, in their community, in their world. I really hope that this talk today has encouraged you to go learn something creative, something new, maybe something you're not good at yet. Maybe it's harmonic analysis. If that's the case, then stay till the end of the video and click on the link for a demo of what I'm going to be doing with the intensive. I look forward to having you join me in my virtual classroom and happy listening.